All right, we're back in Revelation, second week of Revelation. Uh, we're doing all of Revelation in just 13 weeks. So we are, in a sense, doing a survey, but we are taking some deep dives uh, into different kinds of scriptures. Today we're tackling two um, chapters. <clears throat> and so obviously we're not going to be able to go into great depth, although I hope to be able to cover them fairly well in this. We'll, we'll read through the chapters uh, as we go through the sermon today. And uh, just to recap on last week, as we're approaching Revelation, uh, it is both an easy task, or I should say a simple task, and a difficult task. It's simple because right from the very beginning, the author, John, tells us this is what's happening. In fact, Jesus tells us this is what's happening. Most of the scriptures are not God uh, didactically saying, now, uh, author of scripture, Write this down for me. It is God speaking through people, like a, a partnership, the Holy Spirit and these human authors. In the book of Revelation, or the letter of revealing Jesus, as we looked at last week, we see it's a little bit different where the, our King Jesus himself comes and says, hey, John, write these things to these seven churches. We saw from the beginning, <clears throat> this letter is not some sort of doom prophecy, which is how it's generally received in our culture, like in 2022 in the West today, Revelation is read very wrong. It is either feared on the one hand, and people just avoid it, or on the other hand, it's totally obfuscated, and uh, it's not, like John says, it's the revealing of Jesus. That's what the letter of Revelation is. It's a whole letter revealing Jesus. But instead, People say, well, it's not revealing. It's like an obfuscation. It's a covering. It's a mystery. You can't understand it. Only I can understand it. And so and come and listen to me and I'll tell you what it really means. I oh, no, 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 no. Revelation is simple. It's simple and it's complex because we don't have, like we looked at last week, we don't have this kind of um, apocalyptic writing these days. We know how to read poetry. We are more used to reading prophecy but when it comes to a revealing like this, that's what apocalyptic literature means. It's a revealing through signs, through symbols of truths. <clears throat> uh, so we need to do a bit of work, but the work is there to help us understand. We're supposed to be able to understand this book. We're supposed to be able to understand the letter because it's a revealing. Now, I would say good on you for being here today. Uh, normally, on public, uh, sorry, public holidays, normally people you know, might go away and so you're here on public holiday, but it's also school holidays, people would be away. So double whammy, school holiday and public holiday and it's a really nice day outside. Uh, we haven't had very many nice days for the last couple of months and it's the beginning of daylight savings. So like this quadruple whammy of kind of reasons to have to, like things to fight against to actually be here in community on a Sunday morning, but here you are, well done. Uh, it is really, really good. And the fact that we're covering such a contentious book as well, this book of Revelation, uh, the letter of revealing. Uh, things are stacked against you, and yet here you are, keen. Uh, you, you had to sit through or you got to experience kids singing before, whichever your perspective. Uh, <clears throat> and so what I want to do is ask God to help us in our understanding because Scripture is for us. It's for us to understand and especially as we get to the letter of revealing Jesus, we are supposed to be able to see Jesus. We're supposed to be able to understand. And so let's, let's ask the Spirit to help us as we open Scripture today. So Father, again, we want to thank you for your Scriptures. Thank you that you haven't left us to our own devices to try to just figure things out by ourselves or uh, discern the times, discern your will. Try to understand who you are by just what we see, but you've given us, you've revealed to us yourself in your scriptures. And so help us as we open up your word today uh, to have understanding. As we're looking at the revealing of Jesus, help us to see Jesus. Help, Lord, help us uh, whose minds have been uh, filled or uh, our understanding of these words have been obfuscated or confused by poor teaching, um, kind of a mythological understanding of these words, help us to have clarity. Help us to be in step with the Spirit. Help us to make much of Jesus, in whose name we ask. Amen. 
So as we get to the letter of revealing Jesus, that's what we saw last week. We saw it is a letter. It's a revealing or an, a, a, it's an apocalypse, uh, which means to be revealed, to be unveiled, uncovered. And it's prophecy. So prophecy is not just telling of the future. Prophecy is a, a revealing or an explaining of a truth from God. So that, like we'll see over the next couple of months, some of Revelation deals with events that have passed, that have gone in the past. Some of Revelation deals with events that are happening in the time of its writing. Some of the events in Revelation are in, into the future, like at the very, very end of things. <clears throat> but Revelation is, Revelation is uh, generally understood at the popular level um, by people who, again, tend to either avoid it or really, or really kind of fear it um, as all about end times. And in a sense, it, it is about end times, but perhaps not as we understand end times. So we hear, man, even I read an article this week from a secular newspaper in the States about the fear of the rapture or fear of the end times, about people who, largely evangelical Christians in the States, who live in fear, like uh, building underground bunkers and stockpiling food, and all because they have a base level of anxiety about the end times, whereas the letter of revealing Jesus is supposed to give us confidence and, and to assuage our fears, to deal with our fears about the world that we're living in. Which is, again, why it's so important that we understand this letter, what is going on in the letter. It is about the end times for people who are experts in the book of Revelation, who say, well, you know, we, look, we, look, we can look to wars and famine and flood and earthquakes and all of these things are pointing us to the end times. Uh, and our... To that, I would say, yeah, but we've always had wars. We've always had earthquakes. We've always had famine. We've always had, even Jesus says, you know, you'll be, you hear about wars and rumors of wars, and you'll say, and that's not the end. And here we have people in our day saying, see all of these signs of evidences that we're living in the end times. And I say, yeah, but we have been living in these end times since Jesus came. We're not newly, freshly in these end times. We have been in the end times. This letter of revealing Jesus was written, like we looked at last week, written specifically to seven churches in kind of modern day Turkey. But it's written for all of us and all believers since it was written. So from either 60 or 90 AD, whenever it was written, from the first century to now, this book, this letter of revealing Jesus, was written to reveal Jesus to every church in every generation. So yes, it is about the end times, but only in, in so far as we have been living in the end times since Jesus died and rose again. The original seven churches themselves were living in the end times. This is the, this is the perspective we need to have when we come to the letter of, reveal, of revealing Jesus. It's written to people living in the end times. So are we more now in the end times than they were then? In a sense, yes, because we're nearer to the end. But in another sense, no, because we're in the same... We still have famines. We still have wars and rumours of wars. We still have earthquakes. We still have all of these things that are the signs of the times, but they're not freshly, newly uh, meaningful now in a way that they weren't then. The letter of revealing Jesus is trying to help us understand that we're not wrong to think that we're in the end times, we're wrong when we think we're in the end times in a different kind of sense to the original hearers, the original addressees. Um, my caveat to that is, yes, there is more to come. We're not what, what are known as preterists, like full preterists, that say, well, everything that we read in the letter of revealing Jesus has already happened in the first century, then there's nothing else to come, <clears throat> no future kind of resurrection or no, nothing future to come. Uh, we're not that. We, we believe actually it's, it shows us windows. It's opening doors to show us events that have passed, to help us understand them so that we wouldn't live in fear. It's written to the people in the day to help them understand current events, to help them not live in fear. And it's opening up windows to still yet to come, like culmination of all things, uh, new creation, new heaven, new earth, Um, to help us not live in fear today. So if the result of your reading of the book of Revealing Jesus, the letter of Revealing Jesus is, I'm going to dig an underground bunker and, you know, get a couple of decades worth of food and water and that kind of stuff. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying don't do that in response to reading the letter of Revealing Jesus. 
It's not what it's about. It's to give you encouragement. It's to give you hope. And as we'll see today, as we're reading these uh, a letter to seven churches, different aspects of living in the current age, or in living in the end times, different warnings, different encouragements, <clears throat> different promises um, that they actually help us to encourage us to stand firm today, to know Jesus today, to see Jesus today. We looked at last week again at um, you know, why, why apocalyptic language? Why not just, well, here it is. Here's, here's the straight out facts. Why uh, uh, allusion to things that have gone before rather than just saying, I oh, remember how Ezekiel said this. Well, this is what this means and this is how you apply it today. Uh, well, again, the original readers would have had a much greater understanding being used to reading these kinds of writings. And so we need to do some work to understand what is meant to be understood. For example, we looked last week at uh, why say of Jesus, who's walking among the lampstands and holding seven stars in his right hand, why say of him all of these, why say he's someone like a son of man uh, with you know, seven stars and seven lampstands? Why not just say, here's our risen King Jesus who is walking among his churches today and still sending his messengers to them uh, even in the midst of our current age. Why say these things like this? Well, again, we looked at last week, it's because this letter of revealing Jesus is trying to help us understand how everything that's come before, uh, all of these uh, allusions and prophecies in the Old Testament in particular, have their fulfillment or climax in Jesus. And so why someone like the Son of Man, so that the original readers would hear and echo Daniel and think, oh, this is the one who was promised not just identifying Jesus personally by name, or he's Jesus, our king, but identifying him, like anchoring him into the psyche of the hearers and the listeners and us to help us understand not just who it is materially, but who he is in, in terms of meaning. And now, so we're in the continuation of the first vision from last week. Jesus is dictating a letter to John, to these seven churches, so not seven letters, but one letter to seven churches and by extension for all of us. So I'm going to actually read these two chapters, these, these kind of seven points of a letter. Uh, we'll go through, like I said, pretty quickly. It's not going to be a lengthy sermon today. Now, fairly quickly, to pick out, there are seven warnings. There are a few encouragements and there are seven promises to these churches and to us. That's what we're going to be looking for today. All right. Seven churches. Uh, one thing I want you to um, know up front. So you hear a few phrases said over and over and over again. Uh, one of these is, you hear this phrase, to the one who overcomes or to the one who conquers. You hear this over and over and over again. Um, this word conquers or overcomes, just so we get a bit of an understanding of it, so that when we actually hear it, we're like, oh, there, there's that thing that um, we're, looking, we're listening in for these promises coming from Jesus. This word conquer, same word where uh, the brand Nike gets their name from, Nike, which means to overcome or to win or to be victorious. And so what uh, King Jesus is saying, to the, one who, to the one who wins, whatever the current situation is, and we'll hear about churches that are suffering, they're being persecuted. We'll hear some churches that are just distracted, distracted by the good life even. Uh, some that are deceived, deceived into thinking that good things are evil and evil things are good. Uh, we'll hear some, so uh, there's different kinds of, of um, uh, tactics of the enemy against the churches and against us. And Jesus says over and over and over again, man, if you, if you overcome, if you conquer, if you win, uh, just do it. If you, if you overcome, then here are some promises for you. So listen for that as we do. Let me pick it up. Uh, write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the beginning of chapter two. Who are angels? We've dealt with this in the past. I don't want to go into like a deep dive on angels now. Uh, but let me read from Hebrews to help us understand what does he mean by angels? It says, uh, in, this is in Hebrews. Now to which of the angels has he, that is God, ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation. So 
to what I'm going to do about angels. That's basically all I want to mention about angels. The angels are spiritual beings. They're servants of God to serve the children of God. That's basically what it is. Um, another translation might be messengers. They are messengers from God. <clears throat> Sometimes in Scripture we see angels as, um, as just looking like you or me. Not particularly spectacular or angelic, just ordinary uh, kind of messengers from God. Some beings that we uh, consider angels, if you saw them, would be incredibly uh, freaky. And, um, and, and rightly, when some people in Scripture meet angels, they are very fearful at these angelic beings. Um, but they are not to be, uh, we're not to, supposed to kind of wonder over them and obsess over them and uh, these kinds of things. These are messengers from God for us. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars. So remember, the one who's sending those seven messengers in his right hand, and he walks among the seven golden, lamp, golden lampstands. So again, he's addressing to these churches, uh, from your King Jesus, who walks with you, who's still serving you today. I know your works, your labor and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you found them to be liars. I know that you've uh, persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name and you've not grown weary. Jesus is praising the Ephesian church. He's saying, man, I, I know you. I know you've been doing great. I know your good works. I know you're trying to hold on to the teaching as it was given from the apostles. I don't to tolerate liars or false teachers. He says, I, I see you. The church had a good beginning. I don't know if you remember in Acts 19, you see kind of the birth of the church in Ephesus where they come together and they get rid of all of their idols. They burn them. And you see actually some like social economic change throughout the whole culture in the region as the gospel grips the hearts of the people in Ephesus. But Jesus, Jesus goes on and says, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then how far you've fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you do have this. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So again, Jesus is saying, man, I know your works. I know you're trying to do, you're trying to live for me. You're trying to do all these good things for me. You're even holding fast to the truth that you were first given. But... You forgot to love me. So I don't, I don't want you know, automatons. I don't want robots just going out and doing things for me. I've got angels. I'm the one who has the seven stars in my hand. I have the angels at my beck and call. I don't want more angels. I came for a people, for a royal priesthood. I came for sons and daughters, for brothers and sisters. I, came, I showed you my love so that you would love me. Not just go do awesome things for me, but love me, seek me. Come back to me, he says, do what you did it first. Remember what you did, how you abandoned all other loves? Repent, turn around. Stop trying to do things your own way. Come back to me. Look great on the outside, doing lots of good things, good teaching, fighting for truth, but show me the love is what he's saying. Otherwise, if you don't show me the love, I'm going to remove your lampstand. You're claiming to be the light of the world, like you know, a city set on a hill, lamp on a lampstand, giving light to all in the house. I'm going to remove your lampstand if you don't. And guys, this is the last thing we hear about the Ephesian church in Scripture. Phenomenal start, like vaporous finish. It says, let anyone who has ears to hear Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I'll give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So we hear some encouragement, a warning, and a promise. And we'll see this pretty much over and over again through the seven churches. So let's look at these other six churches. Write to the angel of the church in Smyrna. Thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. So again, he's claiming himself as God. Jesus, this is. I know your affliction and poverty, but you're rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. 
Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you and you will, ex- you will experience affliction for 10 days. So 10 days symbolically meaning uh, a little bit of time, but not a super long time. So not necessarily exactly seven days. Remember, we're talking about signs and symbols that point to significance, point to truth. He says, be faithful to the point of death and I'll give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will never be harmed by the second death. Write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. Thus says the one who has the the sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, mind you. I know where you live. It's not not a threat. Like, I know where you live. It's like, I know I know where you live. Where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness was put to death among you, where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to place a stumbling block in front of the Israelites, to eat meat sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. In the same way, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So repent. Otherwise, I'll come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. I'll also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name is inscribed that no one knows except the one who receives it. So again, we're going to kind of breeze through these a little bit and then uh, kind of look at all of the warnings and all of the promises together. Write to the angel of the church in Tartara. Thus says the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze. I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service and endurance. I know that your your last works are greater than the first. Man, he's praising these guys. But I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. This character will feature again a couple times in the letter of revealing Jesus who calls herself a prophetess and teaches and deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat meat sacrificed to idols. So similar to the last church. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I'll throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great affliction, unless they repent of her works. I'll strike her dead. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts, And I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Tartara, who do not hold this teaching, who haven't known the so-called secrets of Satan, as they say, I'm not putting any other burden on you. Only hold to what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works to the end, I'll give him authority over the nations. And he'll rule them with an iron scepter. He'll shatter them like uh, like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I will also give him the morning star. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I went down in the next chapter. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis. Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you are not alert, I will come like a thief and you have no idea what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people inside us who have not defiled their clothes and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Two more. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David and opens, uh, who opens and no one will close and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I've placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to endure. I'll also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have 
so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, uh, to the one, sorry, yeah, the one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. We'll get into the new Jerusalem a little bit later in Revelation. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And lastly, write to the church of, uh, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the amen, the yes. The faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed. And ointment to spread in your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who hears, who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so that's a lot of scripture. <clears throat> One letter, seven bits, seven chunks to seven churches. We hear warnings, encouragements. We hear promises. We hear over and over and over again. Jesus, we, we heard last week what it means that the one like the Son of Man walks among the seven lampstands that Jesus is with his church. And so he can say to his church, I know you guys. I know your works. I'm not a distant deity. I'm not talking out of ignorance. When I write to you, I know exactly what's going on. So when he says to one church, you, you are poor and you know of your poverty, but please hear me, you're rich. You're rich in the kingdom economy. You're rich in the things that matter. It's trying to encourage them. Don't see things from a worldly perspective. See things how I see things. You are rich. And he says to another church, my goodness, you think you're rich? You're comfortable? You think you got it together? You are poor, naked, shameful, and at the point of death. He says, I know you, I know you. I'm walking with you. I'm among you. He keeps talking about the synagogue of Satan, the people who claim to be from God and you have nothing to do with him. He says, man, they claim to be from me. They claim to represent me in the world. Uh, they are not from me. Stop listening to them. Stop going to them for your understanding of, of who I am. We hear about Jezebel, uh, who is a representative of the cities or the culture that stands against God. Jezebel's been Babylon. Jezebel here is Rome. We hear Jesus warning them. What are the warnings? Seven warnings. He says, if you have abandoned your first love, Repent and come back to Jesus and do what you did at first. That's the one first warning. Second warning, don't be afraid when people hate you and persecute you, even if it costs you your life, is the second warning. Don't think you're poor when you're really so rich in Jesus. Thirdly, take your doctrine seriously. Don't treat faith in Jesus as a choose-your-own-adventure with a little bit of this, and a little bit of that. He says, love what's true, even when it's countercultural and difficult to hold to. He says, don't tolerate Jezebel. Don't tolerate the culture. Not, not like in an external sense, like not saying go fight the culture wars out there. He's saying in you, in, inside the church, don't let the, the things of like the, the, the Jezebel come into you. He says, don't blend into the world. You are a lamp on a stand. The poorest of the Ephesian church, what does uh, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them? Or oh, Jesus, what, is, what in nature does darkness have to do with light? He says, you are, you are the light. But if the light becomes dark, 
by just blending in with the darkness around it. Where is this light? The lampstand's gone. It's going to be removed. Another warning, you have a reputation for life, but you're dead. It says, be alert. Strengthen what remains before it flames out. You think you're a raging fire? You are an ember about to go out. Just fan it into flame because you look awesome from a worldly perspective and you're nearly dead spiritually. Another warning says, if you're running the race well, hold on. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. You can do it. Hold on to your crown. Let no one take it from you. And then the last warning, if you think you have everything you need because you're comfortable, you're healthy, you're wealthy, but you're lukewarm towards Jesus, you're neither hot nor cold, a little bit in, a little bit out. Sure, I appreciate Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. I will take you as my saviour, but I'm going to stay my own Lord. You might not say that with your mouth, but the later Syrians were saying it with their lives. Claim him when it's helpful for me. Abandon him or deny him when, with my words or how I live when it's convenient for him. He says, you say I'm rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realise that you're wretched, pitiful, pitiful, poor, blind and naked and the lukewarm will be vomited out. Now, I've heard people say, <clears throat> they've, they've kind, of, uh, kind of translated or interpreted these seven churches as being like seven ages of the church. So you know, the first one was this church and the last one's the latest year, and, and we're clearly the latest in church. Uh, I don't think that's what this is saying at all. Seven churches representing the universal church. Seven words saying, here are seven warnings to the church. Seven representations of some of the ways that the enemy of souls will try to deceive us or distract us that would lead to our destruction. All of them, warnings against current deception or distraction or warnings against being deceived or distracted when they're running really well. And we need to heed these warnings. These are not mystical, uh, unintelligible, ununderstandable um, mythical kind of things. This is a letter of Jesus revealing Jesus and also revealing us to us. And we see ourselves in these seven churches, some, some of them more starkly than others. And maybe even throughout your life, some of these will represent your distraction or uh, your deception more than others. Uh, and probably even just culturally, some more than others as well. Uh, we need to be aware of these seven temptations, seven um, strategies of the enemy of souls. But there are also seven promises that come with each of these warnings. Jesus is promising to those who are victorious over distraction, victorious over deception, that these, that these uh, churches serve as warning signs against. This is what he says. He says, if you repent and come back and do what you did at first, if you do this, remember your first love. He says, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. I will gift to you immortality. You'll live forever with me. And again, from the, the, the way we know about the tree of life, we see in the Garden of Eden right at the very beginning. Remember, the letter of revealing Jesus is a recapitulation of everything that's come before, saying, you know, this prophet and this prophet and, and this symbol and this sign and this, allu this uh, uh, illusion, not illusion, illusion, it's all pointing to or fulfilled in Jesus, saying, man, if you overcome, remember the tree of life that was denied to those who turned away from God? you will have access to that tree of life. Repent and come back. Remember your first love. You are not a people just going out there serving a king. You are that. Jesus praises them for doing good works in Ephesus. He says, but remember, your primary thing is to love and be loved by Jesus. Second promise, if you're not afraid of persecution or even death, Jesus says, you won't be harmed by the second death. If you, if you hold out against persecution, against people who <clears throat> would uh, even kill you because of the name of Jesus, he says, they can only kill you, echoing what Jesus said, uh, you know, don't fear the one who can kill your body now. 
Uh, you, you, your reverence belongs to the one who can destroy both body and soul. It says, but there's a promise of those who overcome. You will not be subject to the second death. Again, life, life. It says, hold on to what is true and I will give some of the hidden manna. We need to both hold on to what is true. We need to remember our first love and we need to also live for Jesus, which is the next promise. If you don't live as the world lives, if you don't succumb, if you're not distracted or deceived into thinking that there is a better good for you outside of the love of Jesus, it says, I will give them authority over the nations. If you don't join in with the nations, the promise is that you will, with Jesus, rule the nations. If you don't uh, give in to given to like death and destruction, the promise is that you won't die a second death and that you'll have immortality. It says, I'll give him authority over the nations. He'll rule with them with an iron scepter. He'll shatter them like pottery. Just as I have received this from my father, I will also give him the morning star. So don't join the world. Join Jesus in his rule and reign over the world. It's a far greater promise for the one whose reputation is for being alive, but there's no life. He says, remember what you've received and heard, keep it and repent. If you strengthen what remains, you're this little ember, but if you fan this into flame, he says, if you conquer, you will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. This is one of the most outstanding promises in all the scripture. If you actually understand what's going on here, when Jesus says, man, if you remember me, fan into flame the love for me, live for me. When you were standing before the whole court of heaven, heavenly father, the host of angels, says if you acknowledge me before others, when you stand there, Jesus will say, he's with me, she's with me. This person's with me. In front of everybody. Saying if if your fear is being rejected by others, if your fear is being alone, if your fear is being the only one standing firm, then the promise is that on the ultimate day, you, will, you won't be denied, you won't be rejected, you won't be disowned. You'll be owned and honoured by Jesus himself in front of the host of heaven. It's the most wonderful promise. The other promise, uh, uh, another promise. If you've been running well and you endure to the end, he says, I will make a pillar in the, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God and he'll never go out again. So basically saying, I'll make you a fixture in my home. There's, there's no uncertainty as to your belonging. When, when that thing is done, when you're built into the foundations, uh, you belong there forever. There's no more questioning No more striving or struggling. Uh, He says, to the one who conquers and endures to the end, I'll make a pillar in the temple of God. He'll never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, and my new name. He says, man, we we will be together forever to the one who endures to the end. And lastly, if you've been lukewarm, kind of committed to Jesus, keen on his love, and his salvation, but not so keen on his lordship, or he just kind of, well, I like, I like your lordship here, and so I can, I can submit to this, but this other kind of lordship I, I don't really love so much, or I, I, I'm questioning whether or not I can believe these promises because the struggle is real. The pressures are real. The culture really does want you to conform. Even our hearts love the shiny new thing that says to us, oh, I will give you fulfillment. I'll make you whole. The promises of Jesus, they're, they're far into the future, but the pain is true now. I'll, I'll help relieve your pain now. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be jealous and repent. Oh, sorry, zealous. Be zealous and repent. I mean, it's almost the same. Be keen for the things of and from him and repent. He says, see, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and eat with him and he with me. Hear 
Jesus knocking on your door. So this whole vision, this is the, like the ending of this first vision. Say, man, I, I'm, I live with my churches. I'm among my churches. I'm still sending servants to my, I'm still serving my churches. I'm writing to my churches. I'm saying, please come back. Please remember what you were doing at first. Please stop getting in bed. I mean, he uses this, this kind of understanding, this, this uh, illustration. Stop getting in bed with the world. And we'll see in, like in the future, in this book, say, you're, you're my bride. Don't get in bed with the, in the, with the world. You're my bride. But you're joined to me. Come to me. And he's not saying, see, I'm already getting rid of you. Uh, I, I saved you and this is still how you reject me. He says, I'm still here. I'm still knocking on your door. Please open the door to me so I can come in and we can be together. Jesus is long-suffering and he's knocking at our door still. And he says, to the one who conquers, if you open that door, he says, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. He says, you invite me onto your throne, I invite you onto my throne. Just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He's inviting him to union with himself, with God. These are phenomenal, amazing, wonderful promises that are for us today. This is not just a picture of the future. This is for us now. This is to help us live today. This letter of revealing Jesus is for a disparate group of people who are all united to Jesus. Some are rich and think they're poor. Some are poor and think they're rich. Some are running really well. Some are running really shockingly. And to all of them, Jesus is saying, I love you. Let's come back to what we were doing at first. Open up your heart to me. Let me be your Lord and not just your Savior. Savior. Let me sit on your throne and then you come sit on my throne. These are, these are scandalous promises that the creator of everything purely volitional, does as he pleases, like breathes and galaxies appear, that he would condescend to still knock on our door, even when we give him lip service but reject him with our lives. He loves you. He loves us. And he invites us. He elevates us. That's what we say often about the gospel. It's not a clean slate. It's not where you're in massive debt to God and he wipes the slate clean and so now you can go and live a good life. No, he, he not just covers over every debt and every sin and all shame. He elevates us to airship with Jesus as if we had done, as if we'd lived the perfect life along with Jesus. He doesn't just say, let me come sit at your table. He does say that. And he says, come and sit at my table. Come sit with me in the heavenlies. This book of revealing Jesus is not spooky, not just something for the future. It's something for here and for now. It's to help us. It's to encourage us that it's worth it, that you can overcome because you have the sevenfold spirit in you, the complete spirit, the Holy Spirit, that we have Jesus walking with us still for us today. So in our discipleship groups this week, or for you and your families in your own time, we're going to explore, we're going to do some work in our own lives, exploring which of these deceptions or distractions are we personally and we corporately most prone to falling for? How are we going to repent of those things? Uh, How are we going to live as conquerors, live as overcomers, reminding ourselves of the seven promises of Jesus. That's, that's, uh, it's tough work, but it's, like, it's the best kind of work because it sets us up for a life of overcoming. You can win the battle against deception and distraction. Jesus has already conquered. He's, he tells us at the end. He's already conquered. And he invites us to sit with him in his overcoming. Let's pray together. Father God, I just want to thank you again for these scriptures. 
This is not something spooky or uh, unintelligible. Uh, We don't need secret codes to try to decipher it. But you have gifted us this great encouragement. Thank you for your warnings in Jesus. Help us to heed these warnings. Like we see at the beginning of this letter, that um, if we read it, hear it, and do it, we'll be blessed. Father, we, we want that blessing that comes from you. And so help us to do the things that we've heard today. We want everything that you have for us, the costly thing, the difficult thing, uh, the thing that detaches us from our idols and even our comfort. We want all of it, Father, if it's from you. And so help us in the power of your Holy Spirit to overcome and live as overcomers, even as we are united with Jesus in his overcoming. Help us to abandon all other hopes and loves so that we can love all the more in the love of Jesus. Help us to encourage one another, challenge one another, um, admonish one another, and bear one another's burdens uh, as we all walk and work uh, in, in partnership with the Spirit towards the same goal. We would conform to the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we ask. Amen.